Good morning, everyone. My name is Chip Neal, and I'm the Vice President of Sales for Abacus Technologies. BMSS was established in 1991 and has grown to become a top 100 accounting and advisory firm in the U.S. With an innovative and service-oriented mindset, our ultimate mission is to provide peace of mind to our clients. They have six locations throughout Alabama and Mississippi and specialize in several industries, including manufacturing, distribution, construction, technology, nonprofits, and government contracting, to name a few. They are an independent member of the BDO Alliance of the United States of America, a nationwide association of independently owned local and regional accounting, consulting, and service firms with similar client service goals. For more information, visit www.bmss.com. Abacus Technologies, based in Birmingham, Alabama, specializes in offering customized cybersecurity, managed IT services, and business intelligence solutions that help companies unleash their full potential. With more than 25 years of industry experience, we have assisted numerous businesses in navigating the ever-changing technology landscape. By doing so, we have enabled companies to overcome today's challenges while also guiding them towards a more promising and accessible tomorrow. We would like to thank you for taking the time to join us this morning on this morning's webinar. BMS presents, BMSS presents Creating Resilience in Your Business. Before we get started, there are a couple of house cleaning keeping items to mention. If you have any questions during the webinar, feel free to use the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen. We will answer all the questions at the end of our panelists' presentations. There will also be polling questions if you would like to receive CPE credits, please answer those as they pop up. We're very fortunate to have Keith Barfield, Corey Brandt, and Brian Jackson with us this morning. Let me give you a little background information on our speakers. Keith Barfield. Keith is one of the firm's founding fathers who enjoys business development and leads the firm's information systems efforts. His responsibilities are vast and the accounting and business issues he manages includes restructuring company debt, bank and bonding relationships and negotiations, operational and organizational restructuring, strategic planning, acquisitions, dispositions, family transitions, business value enhancements, technology utilization and startup mentoring. Key's clients range from architects, construction companies, franchises, and manufacturing and distribution business to, businesses to those in the technology and services industries. Corey, as a director of business development for DRS, Corey oversees the, the formation and business partnerships that support both private and public entities in their disaster recovery needs as well as supports DRS's MVP program through developing supplier relationships. Brian serves on the BMSS leadership team and was named a BBJ top CEO in 2022. In his role as CEO of Abacus Technologies, he oversees all executive decisions and operations of the company, along with providing client solutions and development. Brian began his career in technology by implementing accounting systems, business intelligence solutions, and developing system integration, and now uses that experience to help clients implement and support business applications, computer hardware, network infrastructure, cloud solutions, and cybersecurity processes. It is now my pleasure to turn the webinar over to our panelists. Thank you. Now, Brian, take it away. Thank you, Chip. Really appreciate that introduction. 
In 2007, a finance professor, writer, and former trader, Nassim Nicholas Taleb, published a book called The Black Swan. And there may be some of you who have read this book, but I think it's a great, uh, using The Black Swan, I think it's a great introduction to our topic today. But in that book, he describes a black swan event as an event that's very unpredictable. Um, it may be outside the realm of, of normal expectations. It's not anticipated. It has a massive impact. You know, when it occurs, you know, we see major effects on the economy, societies, and systems that we're used to using every day. Um, oftentimes, it has ret retroactive predictability. You know, when we look back at what happened and how it happened and the effect it had, you know, there's always some indicators that, hey, we knew this was coming. But it's not always clear, you know, of course, until it happens. If you look back in history, you know, even recently, the past 25 years, we've had some black swan events. Uh, think about the 2008 financial crisis and how it affected the access to money, how it affected our businesses. We think about even recently uh, with the pandemic. Uh, that was four years ago. But how it affected, you know, the way we work, um, how it affected uh, the way we look at our health. And also how it affected the uh, the business and how we conduct business in our industries and with each other. But it's not always just a disaster. It's not always just a, um, a, a negative event, but it could also be some types of breakthroughs, technological breakthroughs. Uh, think about how the Internet came on like fire in the 90s. How did that affect our businesses? How did it change the way we conduct business? That access to that technology brought about new businesses, new types of businesses, new ways of providing services uh, to our clients. You think about even more specifically how, you know, companies like Uber and Lyft disrupted public transportation uh, when they came on the market. And even now, even currently, you think about artificial intelligence. Think about how Microsoft Copilot, think about how ChatGPT, you know, have just taken off like wildfire recently and just really, you um, influence the way you know we work it's influenced some professions in good ways and some bad but generally speaking all these could be defined as black swan events now, even if you look within your organization you know why you may be affected by some of these larger events or maybe smaller events that you can think of that have disrupted your business maybe a competitor moves into town right across the street from you maybe a, a new technology or a new uh new product moves into your market and you're just not prepared for it. I mean, that could be your black swan event. So as we think of our talk today, business resilience in the context of a black swan event, why is having resilience important for your business? Business resilience is really, you know, do we have, when you think of business resilience, do we have the capacity as an organization to survive? Whenever we face one of the events, our initial mode is survival mode. Now, how can we maintain our cash flow? How can we maintain our customers? How can we maintain our employees? We always think about, well, is this an opportunity to adapt? Maybe it's an opportunity to grow. How many businesses do you think of can really lean into adversity or have leaned into adversity and come out the other side bigger, better, and stronger than before? So having resilience not only just helps us survive an event, but it also allows us to adapt and grow our businesses in spite of those adverse conditions. Resilient businesses also give us the ability to cope with uncertainties, recover quickly from disruptions. You know, most companies can handle small disruptions or even medium-sized disruptions, but you know, how are you going to cope with that? What kind of communications are you going to put out? What type of financial changes do you need to change you need to make? Uh, how are you facing that uncertainty? You know, having business resilience helps you navigate uh, those various areas uh, a lot better and also recover quickly. But even if you look at long-term success, you know, any business that's been in, you know, in operation for, you know, decades, there's been times when you've had to face complex, unpredictable business environment. And only through resilience can you help you know, overcome that over the long term. Next slide, please. So why is the business resilience important? Now, one, we're all going to face adversity. 
you know, that's something that is given in our business environment. You just look at the world today. We have, uh, you know, we have wars in, going over in Europe right now. We have cybersecurity attacks and events that are happening. Uh, we have, you know, uncertainty in the economy, uh, uncertainty uh, this year with an election year. So there's no doubt that adversity is going to be part of our business plan, whether we expect it to be or not, it's going to be there. And we've got to find a way as businesses to survive and thrive through that adversity. We also have to find ways to minimize the impact of it. And no doubt adversity disrupts our operations, uh, may disrupt our financial stability of our, our businesses, but we have to find a way to maintain business continuity through that. Facing adversity is not always cheap. And I think uh, the many times that we have um, worked with clients through different type of cybersecurity attack, attacks, different types of disasters or, or recovery events, uh, a lot of times spending that money during the event is, is very expensive. Um, it's better to be proactive, to prepare. Uh, that will help you when you face adversity, uh, you know, reduce the cost, reduce the impact at least financially. And it'll also help you protect your organization. So having a plan, being proactive is going to be helpful. There's a saying out there, you know, no plan survives first contact with the enemy, but it's the art and the activity of planning that's invaluable. So we need to have a plan so we can overcome, reduce costs, and protect our organization's reputation as we face these adversities. And finally, we never really think about this, but how can we position ourselves to take advantage of these black swan events, of these adverse conditions? Because if we're prepared, you know, we've got our finances in order, we've got our technology in order, we have a plan, we have our people engaged, more than likely our competitors, or maybe some of them don't. You know, maybe there's some that are quasi-competitors that don't as well. Well, how can we take advantage of that? How can we pivot? How can we lean into the adversity and respond to the business environment to not just survive it, not just adapt, but also to thrive in it? Next slide, Julie. So as we talk through this topic today, just a, a couple of questions I'd like to keep in mind. You know, as a business, can you pivot? very easily? Can you adjust your people, processes, and technology, which is really the foundation of all of our systems that we have? You know, have, do you have any contingency plans? Have you thought through, you know, this crisis or that crisis, how you'd respond to it? Um, you given thought, have you written it down? Have you walked through your leadership team with it or your stakeholders through it in your business? How quickly can you return to normal operations after disruption? Is it 90 days? Maybe it's a week. You know, maybe it's, hey, it could be six months. You know, how long can you go with your operations down? I mean, is it a couple of days? You know, maybe it's just 24 hours. But do you have the capacity to even have the resources that get you back to those normal, normal operations after disruption? Think about your leadership and your culture. Can it push through the hard times? You know, is your, is your, are your people strong enough? Is your leisure, leadership team strong enough? to actually get you through these hard times, to get you through that adversity, to be leaders through that process, because leadership is extremely important in adverse conditions or when you're facing adver adversity. And probably one of the most important things of all is effective communication. We all think of communication, you know, outbound communication. Well, you know, what do we need to tell the public or what do we need to tell our customers? Or what do we need to tell our vendors as we manage through a crisis? But how are you going to handle communication you know, within your company. Now, how are you going to communicate to your employees? How are you going to communicate among your leadership? I mean, do you even have a safe mode of communicating with them? What if your email systems are down? What if your phone system's not available? Have you had, do you have contingencies to communicate uh, with your employees uh, outside of the norms that you currently have? So there are some good questions, I think, to help you assess your resilience as we talk through this topic this morning. Go ahead, Julie. When we think of resilience, the traditional way of thinking is really, at least from my experience, has been in two areas. One, we think of that operations resilience, and that's really the business disruptions. Uh, you know, how can we return business to normal? Uh, how can we get our, our people and processes back to conducting transactions as we would in a normal environment? But on the other end, we also have technology resilience. Well, how can we keep an acceptable level of service and reliability through a severe disruptions 
to your systems. And in many cases, this has been something that's looked at almost separately in a lot of organizations. It doesn't really matter that because volatility, uncertainty, complexity, amb ambiguity, you know, this is the norm in the digital world. But when these things come to bear, they're going to affect both of these areas regardless. You know, your business is going to be disrupted. And your systems may dis be disrupted. And you may have one that's available and the other one not. Let's go to the next slide, Julie. So what I encourage you this morning is to take a different look at how you look at resilience in your, in your organization. Now, don't just look at, hey, operationally, this is what we have to have function. Hey, I've got a good IT department or managed service provider that can get our technology uh, back up and running and, and available. If you don't have those together and working together, then you really don't have a good definition of resili resiliency in your business um, or organization. Many times I work with, we work with technology departments and we have an IT disaster recovery plan. That means, hey, we have the ability to bring the systems back online, make them available, make them reliable, make them secure, and make, it, make the data and applications available to the business. However, the business usually doesn't have a plan. You know, maybe they need, they haven't thought about an alternative place to work and the capacity of that alternative place. Uh, maybe they haven't thought about equipment that may, may be needed to resume operations. Maybe they haven't thought about some of the mediums of communication, how that may have changed for them to retrieve or send orders or information out to clients and customers through communication channels. But we live in such a, a world today, especially in our businesses, where you know those really operate, you know, the same have to operate in tandem. Our businesses cannot function without technology. And without the business, we have no technology. So we really have to think about how we can combine or converge these two areas to really build business resilience in our organization. It gives us the ability to you know, adapt to business disruptions, but leverage that technology and capabilities so we can continue to do business. But also technology can also give us the ability to adjust and take advantage of these new conditions, conditions and even change and go after new opportunities. Go to the next slide. So let's take just a few minutes to look at some of the components that we can leverage for business resilience when it comes to technology. And I took these components just from really our recent experience with the pandemic and how technology played such a great, uh, you know, could have been a really good thing for businesses, but sometimes it also um, was a negative uh, for that business as well. So we think about just the core investments you make in technology in your, in your company. That makes can make a huge difference you know in your resilience uh to adverse conditions you think about even down to what equipment you give the user i think back four years ago when during march probably this time of the year almost exactly four years ago you know we had to all go work from home not every company we worked with and not many clients we had could do that they had not thought through the process of hey we need this capability and their users had desktops. They didn't have laptops. Uh, their network wasn't really configured to allow efficient remote access. Uh, their operational systems were a lot of times on premise. So their capacity to conduct business was very limited. So you need to think about your core investments, how you're investing technology all the way from, you know, what machines you're giving users and what you expect from that to how your systems are architected you know, to conduct um, operations in your business. The use of cloud technologies is a lot more widely adopted post-pandemic than it was many years ago. Uh, we found that businesses that had adopted cloud technologies, they, they have more flexibility. Uh, if it's in the cloud, they pretty much can work from anywhere they have an internet connection. Makes it very easy to access operational systems, operational technologies, communication systems, and gives them a lot of flexibility um, and efficiency. I think of one client we have in mind now who uh, really did a great job of, of adopting cloud technologies, um, especially uh, post-pandemic. You know, they adopted a technology basically that gave them the flexibility to use almost any type of to any type of device to actually access their operational applications. They could go from anything from a Chromebook to an iPad to their normal laptop or a home computer, and they could securely access their applications and systems using cloud-based technology. On the other hand, we had other clients who had on-premise applications, and they had not 
made those investments to move to the cloud, or maybe they just didn't have the option. It was a lot harder for them to adapt and be resilient uh, in the face of the conditions they were facing. We think about remote work. Whether we want it or not, it's here to stay. I mean, we, we all probably spend time here and again working from home, but remote work does bring some resilience to your organization. Um, it brings some continuity uh, you know, within your operations because now not only can a employee be productive in the office, but they can be just as productive out of the office in an alternative location. Think about how it reduces physical dependencies. You know, th there could be a time when the office isn't available, uh, the office uh, infrastructure not available. But if you have the ability to work from home, then you have employees who can go home and work or find another Internet connection and they can uh, be just as productive as they need to. So you don't you don't have to depend on your business, the Internet connection there to your business, because at some point that may not be available. But working from home gives you some continuity, but also gives you some flexibility. And think about, you know, diversification of labor resources. You know, you're able to, you know, bring more people to bear um, on in adversity and through into a disaster because they're remote. They don't have to be right there with you. So you can bring in experts, bring in people to help you out uh, with that as well. I really can't say enough about security. Um, we live in a time that uh, it's not if or when an attack is going to occur, but it, it will happen to you. And having a business that resilience against any type of cybersecurity attack is, attack is extremely important. And I really encourage you to build, uh, not just look at your disaster recovery plan, your business continuity, but your overall business resilience to include, you know, plans and contingencies for some type of cyber attack. Um, Attacks are not getting, uh, you know, they're definitely, the frequency of attack, attacks is definitely not going down. Um, we've recently seen many different attacks. We saw United Healthcare uh, take a big attack and pay ransom. We've seen even some local agencies here in our state uh, recently get attacked where systems were affected. Uh, but this is something that we're going to face at some point. You know, what steps are you taking to safeguard your organization and assets from security-based attacks or cybersecurity attacks? You know, think about your reputation. You know, what if a threat actor were to compromise your systems and they were going to release your employee data on the dark web or made to the public? You've got to think about how you would handle situations like that. What kind of contingency do you have in place? What kind of plans do you have in place to be resilient through that threat? Um, what if your systems are not available? Uh, do you have backups of your data? You know, how um, how often do you test those backups. I mean, all these things are safeguards and as part of security that can build business resilience um, for you. And finally, I threw this one on here because I think it's important as we think this, but think about how you're leveraging your data. Uh, as companies, we all generate data, we consume data, we may purchase data, but uh, we always don't think about what our data can tell us about our organization. But it can also help us build resilience because it gives us the ability to build what-if scenarios. And it's not just maybe financial what-if scenarios, but I think you can also use that data for operational what-if scenarios. It can be a really good tool for planning, a good tool for tabletop exercises, and also maybe even allow you to gauge the impact of certain scenarios uh, that may affect supply chain. Maybe it affects uh, your access to human resources. Uh, maybe it affects your access to financial resources as well. And then, of course, you know, either here now or in the near future, you know, AI models will help us if we have the data to help us make decisions and support our decisions. Uh, if we feed data into an AI model, then it's going to be able to maybe provide us with insights and drive us toward helping us make, make decisions when we face certain types of scenarios that could adversely affect our business. So data is also a wonderful technology component to help you build resilience because uh, you already have it. You know, why not use it uh, to help build those what-if scenarios? Next slide. So in conclusion, I want to talk about learning from setbacks. And I'm, I'm a big proponent of taking time to retroactively look at events and to see how can we improve and I think this needs to be a part of, of any type of resilience plan 
is debrief. You know, what did you learn? You know, what went right? Uh, what did you need to change? What do we need not to do again? I mean, all those things are important questions you need to ask yourself and and have that take that time to look out the past and say, well, you know, did we come out of this better? You know, or could we have come out of this better? You know, get a feedback loop. And, and I think this is important when you talk to your employees, to your vendors, to your customers. Uh, you know, hey, we faced this adverse condition. We faced this challenge. How did we do? How could we have done better in your eyes? Having that feedback looks important because it helps you plan and prepare for the next event uh, that you might encounter either now or later. And think about stories of businesses that adapted. I love going back and reading, um, and, and Corey has some great, and, and I'm sure Keith has too, some great stories of businesses that have faced faced different types of adversity, but they've thrived. They've gotten through them stronger and better. There's so much to learn from other people's experiences and, and their experiences, what they faced, maybe things they didn't know were going to happen, maybe things they did. Uh, there's always some unexpected, unanticipated events within any challenge. Uh, but look at those stories. See what you can learn from them. Uh, there's all kinds of books and movies that you can look at about disasters and, and companies facing adversity that you can learn a lot from. So I'm going to turn it over to Corey now, and he's going to uh, talk through about planning for disaster. So Corey, your mic. Thank you, Brian. Good morning, everybody. Appreciate you guys taking the time out of your mornings to learn a little bit about building resiliency, which is, as we all know, a pretty hot topic and hot word that we're hearing, hearing plenty. And maybe some, maybe it falls on deaf ears at times, but I, just because we hear it so frequently, however, it is extremely important. It is a, a, a key topic for a reason and something that we, as a firm, have kind of shifted our focus to, you know, recent years is, is building resiliency versus just a post-loss recovery world. So um, you can go to the next slide, please. But just to give you an idea of like what our firm does is we specialize in disaster cost recovery. So we have a group of forensic accountants, commercial claims consultants, and we do a ton in the FEMA public assistance realm. So we've spent our careers helping out um, both private and public entities following a loss, right? Looking at the lens from what has occurred, what's the damage that's taken place, you know, and then how are you going to build back from, from what just occurred and then recover financially, right? Looking at your commercial insurance policy, um, if you're a public entity, you're looking at the federal and state grants that are out there to to rebuild, but taking that lens of like seeing what happens after an event and understanding the the policy implications that are set years prior or months prior and the decisions made early on, we have shifted our focus to like let's get in front of this, right? Let's let's talk to clients on a more proactive approach and plan for disaster, right? Knowing what what things look like after the fact, taking those lessons learned. And always having the chance of like, ah, if you would have had this coverage, this would have been beneficial. If we would have had this vendor in place, this would have been beneficial. So taking all those lessons learned over the year, years and, and going on the front end is, is where this initiative has taken place and, and kind of where this approach that we call planning for disaster has has taken um, heed. So just, you know, we, we like to keep it sports related right now and it's March Madness. It should be pretty, pretty fun a couple of days here. Uh, but just as in sports, you know, the preseason affords you an opportunity or the ability to analyze your effectiveness, prepare for the uncertainty and kind of gauge your disaster recovery fitness level. And we're looking at this from like a, a property and physical damage perspective. So I love being a part of this conversation because you have Abacus who um, is taking a different approach on it versus what we are doing. Um, and just some, some, key, some, some key takeaways that you guys can have here is we like to call it like a simplified approach to developing like a disaster recovery plan, right? Because we're looking at it from property and high level decisions, um, proactive steps to minimize your downtime and restore your balance sheet quickly, realizing that that's of the utmost importance. And then, you know, reviewing and assessing your commercial property insurance coverage, because that's the space that we've, you know, made our careers in. So next slide, please. So the first step that we like to call is review. As you'll see, it's review, identify, implement, monitor. It's four steps under our P for D, planning for disasters. And that first step that we're taking is to, to sit, and, and we, we recommend you guys do this with your you know commercial insurance broker that you have. Um, we do it with, with clients ourselves or we team up with brokers, but to, to work with them to 
identify your business background and loss history. Um, really want to understand, you know, all of your policy named locations. So looking at your schedule of values, um, you may may or may not be surprised that there's plenty of times where you may have not realized a building has sold or a building was acquired or you've been recycling um, your schedule of values for years on end without really going through it with a fine tooth comb. But we've had plenty of experiences where uh, there's damage to a building and you look at the commercial insurance policy and it's not a named location on there um, or vice versa. We've seen some that are on there that are no longer owned by the business, the city, the county, whatever it is. And you're essentially just paying additional premiums for that location that's not there. Um, so reviewing those is very key as well as your just insurance coverage and risk appetite, right? With these with the rising costs in the property market, um, some we've seen some clients and entities take a different approach to how much insurance coverage they're going to get, what they're going to insure themselves, what risks are they willing to take, and it's different for everybody. Um, so understanding those for your yourself and your organization is very key, um, and, and for us to understand that's very beneficial as well. And then you want to look at your existing business continuity or disaster recovery plans. Um, you know, for us, we're, we're focused more on disaster recovery and business continuity as um, Brian, you kind of touched on, can get very, very detailed, right, from who, how, who's going to contact the employees, where are they going to be housed for work, you know, where are you going to set up IT? Like, there's some very elaborate business continuity plans and some, some great firms out there that do that. But, you know, taking those steps um, to get one of those in place so when something does occur, whether it's, you know, a large scale event or it's just a a more localized event, pipe bursting, warehouse fire, things of that nature, like having that booklet that you can open up and, and look through is, is very key and taking the time on the front end to do that will save you um, a lot of headache on the back end. Because as we know, if, if a big event comes through, um, everybody's impacted, right? Family, friends, coworkers, it becomes very stressful. So taking the time to put together some of this business continuity and disaster recovery plans on the front end is is well worth it. And then reviewing this to get an idea of where the opportunity is to improve will be kind of the next step. And then the same thing, risk management plan and resources. Um, some risk management teams will be one person, some can be multiple, um, some can be an entire department, uh, but it's understanding, you know, who's in control, what's the plan is, who are, what are your resources available, uh, and then figuring out what kind of gaps to fill. Um, so we'll go to the next slide, please. And this is, just some key components of insurance policy. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. I am not the commercial claims expert in, on my in my firm, um, and you guys can see this. But it's what I can tell you is I see plenty of times communications going back and forth where we ask for the copy of the insurance policy. We get one over, and then we're like, "Oh, this policy references this policy. Can you send us that policy?" And oh, this one you know references this policy. And there's just so many layered programs out there that it. It does and can take a time, some time. And it's also confusing um, to read through all of these um, policies that you have in place and understanding the coverage limits that there are. So this is just a basic, you know, what are the components of it? Um, you guys can read that and maybe ask questions later if you need to, but just thought I'd put that up there. And then the next slide will be like a policy checklist. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, a policy review checklist and same thing here. I won't spend too much time checking on every single one of these, but if you're taking this step with your, like I said, either just on your own with your team or you know, preferably with your insurance broker um, is to read through these and treat it as such a simple checklist, right? Because these will help you um, identify what the next steps are in terms of like improving your coverage and improving your policies, making sure that you have identified all of these locate these items within your policy um, because this really sets the stage to potentially save money on premiums or realize that you're underinsured on certain locations or there's certain language in there that could prohibit you from being able to fully financially recover following an event, right? There's professional fees endorsements that may or not may or may not be in there for like a consultant to come on and help you quantify the claim amount, the claim after say a really large loss where you're going back and forth with the carrier. So there's just a lot of, I don't want to say redlining, but the attention to detail that can be done during this process. And, and this is really kind of where like the, the meat and potatoes is in, in this P4D program is just dissecting that commercial insurance policy 
and making sure that everything is as beneficial for you as possible. So if something does occur and you are having access to this policy, that you are properly covered, you do have the right systems in place, the right limits in place. Um, and there's just some different strategies in there in terms of like, you know, repair costs versus actual costs. Is it per building location or per the entire campus? Um, things of those nature that can just really mess with limits and either help or or maybe uh, hinder you in those scenarios. So uh, just some some good points there on the checklist. Uh, and then we'll go to the, the next slide, please. You know, so once you, and then, like I mentioned, after you do all that reviewing, you've you know looked at the team, looked at the policy, looked at some of the resources. The next step is kind of to just naturally identify the key areas for improvement, um, and then developing a disaster recovery. Your kind of team resources. So that's both internal, identifying who in your team is going to be there to communicate with the vendors or communicate with the employees, communicate with the stakeholders, with the clients, well, whatever it is. You know, developing that internal team and knowing who's Who's going to be the lead point of contact? Who's responsible for which activities? Is there a certain triage that's going on? Uh, and identifying that team, and preferably doing like a you know some roundtables or um, what's the word I'm looking for? A dry run certain scenarios where you're just doing tabletop exercises in a just to plan for an event, run a mock event, and then your external team resources, right? Who are you guys reaching out to when something does occur? Do you have MSAs in place with remediation, restoration vendors? Do you need uh, contents? Do you need generators? Understanding who all those key partners are and having it in a simple form um, to be able to reach out and identify who, who am I calling right now? Who's supposed to respond? And, and identifying just that external team as well. Um, they could be, you could have MOU agreements in place. You could have um, teaming agreements. It just all depends on, on your guys' business, where you're at, and, and what's needed for you guys to respond to be you know, back to business as soon as possible, but identifying those resources um, now is much better than trying to identify right when something has occurred. Uh, next slide, please. And then so we've, you know, you've, you've reviewed, reviewed all of your policy, reviewed your current teams, identified the, you know, the areas for improvement, and then the next step is to like implement these activities, right? So you're going to, with all that said, and with all that understood, you're going to work on putting together like a disaster recovery strategy and plan. Um, it could be as simple and high level as possible just to get something down. It could be as in-depth as a full business continuity of operations, co-op planning. Uh, but what we really suggest from, from our standpoint, thinking of a simplified right approach is is making sure that you have standby contracts in place for critical services, right? So there is no, you're racing to contact a remediation or restoration in fir firm in town um, when everybody needs one, right? And they already had standby agreements with other firms and now you're trying to get a hold of somebody and they may be saying, hey, that's not big enough for us or we're too busy or the rates are through the roof, right? And now you're um, paying an arm and a leg for something that you have to do and had you taking the time on the front end to get these agreements in place. And, and these agreements are typically no cost. Um, it can save you a lot of time and a lot of heartache. So we really stress at a bare minimum, just having a restoration or mediation firm. If you're someone that may need temporary power, uh, if you're going to need maybe contents, restoration, or you need modular buildings, whatever it is that you may need to keep your business running immediately following a disaster or to get it repaired, just having those vendors and those contracts in place will save you a ton of time and it'll guarantee that someone's going to come respond within I mean, it could be minutes, could be an hour uh, to even just a local event or a widespread event, but it'll save you a ton of time. We've seen it over and over again in, in unfortunate scenarios, but it's, it's one of the simplest things you can do today just to make sure that when something bad happens, you go, Oh, we've got a person, we've got a firm, they'll be here. Um, in addition to that, you know, is creating that kind of online web portal for your business continuity plan or like a phone tree of your point of contacts. And that would be for both your internal disaster recovery team and external disaster recovery team and just making it easy. You know, and we say online here, obviously, if there's a big cyber attack and you can't get online, maybe good to have a hard copy as well, just a piece of paper, wherever you want to store it, but just to know who you can quickly call, who's the lead, who's the point of contact, their phone and name, company. Uh, just a simple set to make sure you're prepared in those events. Next slide, please. Um, so here's just a, here's an example um, 
this was actually in the northeast so i mean you guys remember when hurricane ida came through not not too long a couple years ago now um came through right there in louisiana and actually made its way out the northeast and became a pretty large flooding event you know new york new jersey pennsylvania um i was in louisiana chasing some some opportunities and next you know i get a call saying hey there's severe flooding in the northeast we're going up there and made my way up there and, and this was a a firm that we had had worked with before uh, had a relationship with and, and this firm actually like had a plan in place right they had taken some steps but what was very unique about this scenario or i, I shouldn't say unique um just kind of surprising is that they even with the plan in place they still had to overcome some adversity right so just for as you guys can see on here it was a large manufacturing facility four feet of water um so much equipment in there dyes paper rolls um the initial projection that they were told in terms of being able to be back in operational was two to four months and you can see on some of those paper rolls down there the water line right there um so just a lot of product loss uh, a lot of downtime um, but their, their restoration firm showed up on site, saw it and said, this is too much for us. This is, this is over our heads. We can't do that. And we get a call from the risk manager and, and you can go to the next slide, please. Um, panicking saying we, we had a plan. We had the person here in place. They showed up, so they can't do anything. What do we do? And, you know, fortunately we were able to help because we do have a large network of these MVPs as we call them, management or partners, you know, in our program where we were like, don't worry, we've got you know, some best-in-class vendors that are out in that area. Um, they can help. We sent them a couple phone numbers. They called the first person. They said they could be there in two hours. They showed up and, and got this going. Um, and it, it definitely allowed them to expedite that process, right? The remediation was done in five weeks. They were able to re resume some partial production six weeks after the loss. Uh, they were initially quoted, you know, two to four months. So they're back in business to some extent, you know, six weeks in and in terms of the claim being paid, they got it paid within 30 days, 40% of it, and 80% within 90 days. Um, but this was someone that, you know, had a plan, had a disaster recovery network, had their resources, um, but still had to pivot, right? They still had to deal with the, oh, shoot, we thought we had a plan. We need to have a plan B. They acted quickly. Uh, they had taken some other, you know, uh, some other our advice kind of on the front end and, and allowed this claim to go quicker just based upon the policies that they had in place, the team that they had there. Um, and they were ecstatic. Um, I mean, as ecstatic as you could be following a terrible event, don't get me wrong, but just a, a good example of what, what the benefits are if you have the proper team in place uh, and you have taken some of the steps on the front end. So just wanted to share that. And next slide, please. Employees as the organization have, and then uh, the last step of the P for D is going to be monitor, right? And this is just going to be an ongoing thing that you should be doing annually, right? You should be constantly working with your your broker uh, and your team to identify any necessary revisions. Um, specifically, like I mentioned in the beginning, the changes in locations of any buildings, the uh, if you've acquired new buildings, if you've sold new buildings, if you've made improvements to new buildings, um, we'll see plenty of times. Um, just like the current market value or appraised value on buildings can be can be way off, um, both maybe on the high end in your policy or on the low end in your policy. And, and, and doing a, I don't know if you want to do it every couple of years, every three years or so, whatever it is, maybe there's a big swing in the market. But having those accurate like values in place is big because you can save um, a pretty penny on, on, on the uh, premiums or you may be overpaying. So we, we recommend to constantly look at that. Same thing just with your insurance coverage, policy forms, trends, just it's an annual thing that should be done. And you're most likely doing this with your broker uh, or your broker is, is, is talking about this. Uh, but to to take the time with them and to go through things with like a, a fine tooth comb, uh, beneficial. Maybe it's something you want to do every couple of years to get a, a property appraisal um, firm out there to manage, to assess all the properties and give you an accurate um, dollar amount. I mean, there are some service, you know, RS means and exact or some tools that can be used, but getting an appraiser out there every couple of years or so, if you can, uh, would be great. But just making sure you're, you're you're going through it, not just like rinse, wash, repeat, get the policy in check, move down, get the SOV in, check it, move it down, like to, to spend some time on that front end because it really can save you. 
you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in premium, tens of thousands, depending on the size. Some some can be million on the business interruption policy. I and mean, we see a, a bunch of those on, you know, the BI values are way off for a company. And, you know, you could be in a world of pain if you don't have the right values, or you could be paying a million dollars more in coverage a year than you need to be doing. Uh, but just looking through that every year and making it a practice and then just any other annual updates that you may have um, would be key in that. And I believe that is the last slide I have. Um, do appreciate the time. And uh, without further ado, we're going to turn it over to Keith Barfield. Good morning. How are y'all doing today? Just wanted to tell you how much I appreciate you letting me uh, speak to this group. I've been really uh, excited to hear Corey speak and also been, uh, I'm always impressed with what Brian has to say about the technology side. And um, just as my opening remarks, um, I wanted to say that after preparing for this webinar, I am very encouraged um, all the black swan events that we've all survived over the years have already made us a pretty resilient businesses. And so uh, today I want to just reflect on our experience and let's, my goal is to let's make intentional plans to stay ready and um, stay resilient. So move to my next slide, please. Okay, so my agenda in general today is uh, there's several tools that we've used and others have used for uh, assessing resilience and getting ready. Um, Corey did a great job on disaster recovery plan. I want to touch on that from a physical uh, side uh, and not so much. Brian did a good job on the technology side. Um, I want to talk about how to identify vulnerabilities in our business models. And then one of the fun things that uh, I really enjoyed was reflecting back over the years, uh, the major historical threats that have happened nationally and locally, and also even thought and made a list of narrow misses. And that was a fun list to think about but also uh, made a list of threats to our resiliency because I think the more we talk about these events that have happened to us, uh, it helps others to uh, learn a lesson and be prepared. You don't have to go through the same thing. And I've got some uh, identification methodology that I want to talk about. And if we have time at the end, uh, even think that we've got a few case studies these are a little bit older case studies uh, about things that have happened to uh, clients and businesses that we've known over the years. Next slide. Okay, our tools and metrics. Let's go to the next slide. So um, disaster recovery plan. Uh, most of the time when I think about this, I really think about um, what Brian talked about disaster recovery for our IT system because it's pervasive in our business, the accounting firm industry. But I realize that uh, for most of our clients, the real risk is, is to the physical world. And that's what I was really happy to see Corey uh, give a war story uh, about that uh, paper plant and the scope and the magnitude and, and knock on wood, we haven't had a client go through um, a lot of, of that level of disaster. But um, there's a lot of um, things that I'm attracted to thinking about and trying to solve the hard problems. Um, Corey said that that company had a disaster recovery plan. And you I like to hit the hardest parts first, you know. Um, now, I will say that Brian did a good job on the COVID pandemic and how that forced us all in a virtual sense of the word. And so uh, to be prepared, to be resilient, 
And, and I think everybody made a, just a wonderful adjustment. I think that was a huge learning experience. I believe that it accelerated the adoption of some technology like Zoom, for instance, and uh, uh, Teams that was on the way and coming anyway. But uh, the pivoting that was done uh, to send the country home, uh, you know, on one day, and uh, I've heard several of my partners, you know, re recite that, oh, well, I thought we were going to be home for two weeks or three weeks and we'd all come back to work and none of us really knew the magnitude. So that was a good event that helped us on the virtual side. And so I, you know, some of my partners challenged me, well, what about on the physical side, you know, um, you know, it's cost prohibitive. If you've got a plant or a production facility, it's really cost prohibitive. You can't have a full extra factory in a different location uh, that won't be hit by the same hurricane or won't be hit by the same tornado, uh, which is prevalent in our area. So, um, but I have had some clients that um, when they outgrew their facility, instead of building on, they added a second location across town. Uh, I had one that uh, I thought was a very smart move, had their um, company was in Birmingham and they went to Bessemer and split up their processes into two different uh, things. And I, I think that was an advantage planning for them. Um, but I also think that even though you can't really have a duplicate backup or a duplicate location uh, is, is so cost intensive, you can establish agreements to outsource critical processes to other vendors. If you build relationships, um, maybe, um, you know, vertical upstream or downstream, uh, think about doing that to help uh, this really hard problem of the physical location, what happens uh, if we're denied access to that. So next slide. Okay, and then uh, obviously uh, during uh, the COVID and the pandemic, we had supply chain issues. And so tools, I wanted to just mention that out on our website, bmss.com, we have um, an article that we uh, wrote and posted March the 7th, 2023. You can go out to our website and search it. Three key supply chain management questions for 2023. Well, they're still valid for 2024. Uh, we've seen a lot of upheaval in this area. And some of the questions that are asked is, number one, does a China plus one strategy adequately uh, diversify uh, my supply chain? And I just highlighted one sentence in here. As long as the goods produced are an ocean away from the markets that consume them, uncertainty from various disruptive factors can lead to shortages, higher costs, lower revenues, and customer dissatisfaction. If you read the article, there's some suggestions there. Maybe China plus one doesn't necessarily do the trick. Um, question two. Does having a backup plan mean I'm prepared for future supply chain disruptions? Hmm. Well, uh, one sentence critical out of here. You can't just plan for one contingency. You need to weigh the outcomes of multiple options across different scenarios. Question three uh, is raising prices. The only way to offset increases in material and transportation cost. Well, just because uh, you raise prices, that doesn't mean there aren't efficiencies that you may be overlooking. And then, of course, my favorite strategy, I added this one, is can I find a near, nearby alternative suppliers? We've worked with some partners in the BDO Alliance, and they've been on some of the webinars with us last year, where we specifically, you know, spent an hour talking about alternative supply chain. And the sentiment seems to be, well, let's, um, let's see if we can develop manufacturing backup relationships, maybe in Mexico or, or Canada or South America, something much, much closer by. 
So uh, those are some of the biggest things that I worry about when we start talking about the physical, how do we create resilience? It's a deep topic. I'm sure a lot of uh, the companies out there have already um, looked at this, but if you haven't, you know, please uh, check on that. Next slide. Okay, and uh, so this is a bit old school and because technology has been handled and insurance has been handled, I just encourage everybody to develop a spreadsheet that they can model uh, their business and have the ability, uh, if some event occurs, what if you had a 5% reduction in sales revenue? Did some research during 2008, nine, the recession. That was the average across the board was a 5%. Our firm experienced a 20% sales reduction uh, during those years. And so uh, that changes things. And how quickly can you respond? If you've got a cash flow projection tool set up, you're projecting the next uh, two years monthly, and you can calculate what your average burn rate is with your level of expenses. And you can also, uh, if you do a balance sheet, keep an eye on your reserves. And what do I mean by reserves? Reserves include things like cash, or if you've got investments, that can, that can be converted to cash uh, or maybe even some quick sell assets. Um, and how many months of burn rate will those reserves last? So, um, you know, there is a delay, I'm sure, of a little bit, maybe 30 days for your, uh, that you want to continue to make payroll while you're waiting on your insurance uh, premiums to pay off. If you at least got that covered, um, check that calculation. It's as old school. Make sure that you know that. And let's go to the next slide. Okay, here's a one that I want to refresh for everybody is your line of credit. And let's check, let's go back and double check the size and availability. Now, if, if you maxed out your line of credit right now, uh, that's that's not good resiliency planning. So there may be some other problems. Call us. We can help you figure out some options to, to get that liquidity freed up. But to check the size, you know, is, is your line of credit available up to 80% of your accounts receivable? And if you have inventory, is it available up to 50% of your inventory? And, um, you know, you can always... Uh, put a press on collecting your AR. You can put a press on selling some inventory to free, you know, to free up that availability. But maybe it's time to just talk about a routine uh, increase in your line of credit with your banker. And I say that because of the amount of PPP money that we saw and helped our clients get into the business. Um, Lots of money came in. Lots of my clients uh, needed that money uh, because of um, downturns and disruptions and things like that. But, um, you know, that money is is either run out or is in a reserve account. And maybe you haven't really need to monitor your line of credit closely for the past few years. And if that's the case, then... Um, Maybe the um, it's a hidden problem. Is it big enough? So the, the last thing I'll say about this before we move on is when you think you can convert um, either some investments or some quick sell assets, uh, make sure that the disaster that you're fighting itself is not going to prevent you from being able to execute some of your plans. So let's go to the next page, please. Okay, identifying vulnerabilities in your business model. And uh, this was uh, a fun thing for me to think back through. Uh, we do this routinely with our business. Uh, I know a year or two ago, where everybody was concerned about a recession coming back. And we spent time and, and money uh, planning for a recession. So go to the next slide. 
And um, so I wanted to just kind of review. I'm old enough to remember all of these uh, items. And I tried to get some national uh, historical threats. Um, one of the earliest I remember was the oil crisis in 1973. Uh, right about the time I was starting to drive, uh, gasoline jumped up to 99 cents a gallon, and I thought I wasn't going to be able to drive anymore. I couldn't afford to. Uh, but um, it caused a real estate collapse out in Houston. And then I, I, pay, I wanted dates with these to see the fr frequency, Chernobyl, no effect on us, 1986. The terrorism, 2001. We had some Health South uh, local fraud situation going on that was probably disruptive to some businesses, 2003. Katrina, 2005. Bernie Madoff, kind of a national thing. I think the Great Recession affected everybody, 2008. The BP oil spill hit the Southeast, 2010, Fukushima, 2011, and then really in our backyard, the Tuscaloosa tornado uh, happened in 2011. And then we had a break. I probably missed something. And then you've got COVID 2020. So um, we've been going through stuff continuously. And I'm, I'm here to argue that every one of these taught us a lesson about resiliency to somebody out there. Next slide. Okay, so I've got a little story about us. And the first uh, thing is, uh, I will say that we had a sprinkler head pop off in our building uh, when we were new, probably in the you know mid-90s. And, and soaked a file cabinet full of files because we were paper files then. And then in 2001, as, as we saw the trade centers fall, it was just um, scary to see all, as accountants, it's scary to see all the paperwork, all the pages, millions of pages blowing down the street as a result of, and, and I think some of those uh, companies, uh, that lost all their paperwork, you know, failed. And so uh, our firm looked at that and said, look, it's, we need to go completely paperless. We don't need to be dependent upon our uh, repository of tax returns and audit work papers, another flood or a tornado coming through and taking our building out. And so uh, we went paperless. We were the first firm in Alabama to go paperless. Um, one year on April 15th, the transformer in our parking lot exploded. And we thought, wow, what if this had exploded on April 1st? We would have never met our tax return deadlines. And so we put in a generator, a natural gas generator. We bought everybody a laptop so that they could go home and work in case we lost power. Uh, later on, while we were being aggressive on uh, technology, our phone system was old and um, we needed to replace it. We said, well, let's look at uh, voice over IP technology. And because everybody had laptops now, we said, let's put everybody on a soft phone and we can eliminate our handsets. And these responses created resiliency. And so uh, when COVID came, believe it or not, it was like everybody turned off their computer in the office took it home, turned it back on, and I feel like we were fully functional with our paperless office, our laptops, and cell phones the very next day. So that's uh, how a series of um, events created resiliency for our firm. Next slide. So the fun stuff Narrow misses. I remember going to seminars about bird flu and Ebola and what would happen if that spread across the U.S. Y2K was going to be a big deal. Did not happen, fortunately. We've seen some cryptocurrency crashes. We've had opioid, opioid and fentanyl crises in our country. And we're still fighting ransomware uh, every day. Next slide. So uh, 
couldn't resist uh, getting chat GPT to uh, make me a list of the top 10 uh, business interruption threats. And here they are. I won't read them. It's all the same things that we've already talked about, but um, I loved using chat GPT for part of my slides. And this is the one I'll give credit to it for. Next slide. Okay, so I'm gonna share with you two tools as I get towards the end of my presentation that um, is, is really um, game changers for us. And the first is a book called The Anticipatory Organization by Daniel Burris. And the subtitle is Turn Disruption and Change into Opportunity and Advantage. And so if it all seems confusing to you, what items or what, what events are likely or not likely, this book is a training manual on how to separate hard trends from soft trends. And uh, Daniel writes a very good story about how to jump ahead, counting on hard trends with low risk and confidence. And uh, one of his one of the favorite things that he's he said in one of his presentations is, "What is your biggest business problem today?" And so you you think about that, and I'd love for y'all to think about it. And then he asked the question, or they surveyed their CEOs, "Could you could you have predicted that this was going to happen six months ago?" And when surveyed, 92% of the CEOs that he's met with said, yeah, we, we saw this coming six months ago. And so I think that's very encouraging that we kind of have a sense of what could happen and we see it coming and developing. So if you're not familiar with this tool, look it up. It's a great resource and I like his methodology. Next slide. Another thing that is a tool that I want to talk about just briefly is BMSS has a Client 361 program. It's a unique service where we walk through the major operational functions of your business, as well as the decisions that could impact your personal well-being. We spent a lot of time developing this checklist. It was originally a business health checkup, but uh, we realized if you'll go down this uh, questionnaire with us, it's very thorough. I mean, and I'm talking about the fastest I've really heard any of our partners make it through with our clients is a two-hour meeting. And if you dig deep, you could actually probably go uh, four hours um, on it. And uh, this is a free service that we offer to our clients to help them assess where they are. And so uh, think about that as an opportunity. If you don't really know where to get started, this would be an ideal place to get started. Contact one of us and we'll help you. And go to the next slide. So this are, these are the key components that we touch on in this extensive questionnaire. And we can buzz through the things that you've got under control. We're just going to ask the question, but we'll put a check mark by an area if you think, hey, yeah, I haven't, I haven't really spent enough time in that. That could be a weakness for us. Um, next, um, let's go to the next slide. And I've got my little personal list of surprise business, business interruption war stories. And a lot of these are very old, but I wanted to touch on some of these. Um, and uh, some of these are clients, some of these are stories that I've, I've been told about, but uh, loss of a single important customer. Uh, early on, we had a foundry that sold electrical castings to a family owned company. And um, this was 80% of the sales for this company. And we identified this in some talks. So we said, hey, are you concerned about your lack of diversification? And they said, well, we'll, we'll work on diversifying, get some other sales in here. But they assured us it wouldn't be a, fan, a problem because the sales company that they were selling to was under family control. 
Believe it or not, less than one year later, the related company canceled the contract and went with another vendor. And I got a panic phone call and it's like, what do we do? And basically, it the only choice was to shut the company down and liquidate all the assets and pull the money out to preserve wealth. So if you've got that kind of scenario, uh, watch out for it. Uh, let's go to another war story. The inability to deliver enough manufactured goods. This was um, a locally owned recreational equipment. Uh, wasn't a client of mine, but had a banker share the story with me. And they got a big contract to supply these recreational equipment through one of the big box uh, stores. And they kind of stretched themselves to get the capital equipment to manufacture and make that. But um, like some of the big stores do, they unilaterally you know, cut the price that they were buying this recreation equipment below the manufacturing cost for this uh, company. And the company refused. They said, well, no, we, I mean, we, we've got a contract. We're, we're not going to uh, put up with that. Our sales price is our sales price. And believe it or not, re retaliation, the big box store, increased their order to supply this recreational equipment nationwide to the point where the manufacturing company could not keep up and therefore they defaulted on the contract and went out of business. So uh, that one's always stuck with me. That's a 25 year old story. Uh, so be careful who you do business with. Next slide, please. Uh, I was also kind of hit, and this is uh, pre-BMSS days, uh, there was a construction company in Jasper that was uh, building uh, an event center uh, at a very large university, and um, whatever happened, delays, et cetera, you know how construction is, the cost overruns exceeded the net worth of the company. And this was a small construction company, but it had a half million dollars of book value. And after 20 years in business, this uh, nice family-owned construction company went out, of, went out of business due to one contract failure. So um, I think maybe construction is a pretty big gambling uh, business. Uh, let's go to the next one. This is, a, again, an old one. Uh, had a tanning bed manufacturer go into business with a partner and guaranteed to provide tanning beds uh, to a partner. And uh, when they couldn't meet capacity, uh, there was a lawsuit saying, hey, uh, we know you're, you're selling tanning beds too, but you have a higher responsibility to us under this contract than you do to sell your own beds direct to the public. And the judge went to trial. The judge decided there was a conflict of interest and said that the owner has a greater responsibility to his new partner than his own company that he owns 100% of. And so the company ran out of beds to sell directly and went bankrupt. That was a bad business deal, a conflict of interest. Next slide. I think we're getting close to the end. I did have, uh, this was uh, kind of strange that uh, I had a roofing company uh, that uh, was hit by a tornado and they were without power for two weeks and uh, they moved their operation to some offsite space. But during that time when they should have been making money like crazy and they, their phones were out of service and they depleted their uh, company cash reserves. So um, eventually the business closed due to a lack of resources and the owner had one little health issue and it was over. So um, another story close to my heart. So next slide. And then I also had a business mistake where we had a, a drywall contractor that was doing um, Walmarts and uh, they, they did several. And then they bid four super centers off of a square foot takeoff. Uh, what they didn't think about, though, is when you do a square foot takeoff, the square footage is the same, but a super center is two stories tall. 
So they did not bid on, they did not include in their bid prices for scaffolding and lifts to sheetrock the second story. And it was major. And so they defaulted on all four contracts, eventually running them out of business. So um, I think that was the last one. Uh, check it out for me. Is there another slide? Okay, perfect. So I'm going to turn it back over to Chip for questions. Thank you so much. I believe I speak for all of us saying that we're tremendously grateful for the valuable information you shared with us. At this time, we'll begin taking questions from the audience. If you have a question, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Okay, well, thank you for joining us and a huge thank you to Keith, Corey, and Brian for taking the time to speak with us today. As a reminder, CPE certificates will be issued two to three weeks following today's webinar. Thank you and have a wonderful day.